we all live inside a streaming world and the last thing you want to see is the reacher page takes longer to load than it takes for reacher to land a punch or you don't want things to start buffering right before iron man snaps his finger akamai is known for creating the cdn that is the backbone of modern streaming services akamai partners with some of the most innovative companies in the space to further improve your experience and Leminar is one such company that has been making waves in the world of content delivery. Today we have with us Narendra Nag, CEO of Leminar, to deep dive into this topic. Narendra, it's great to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Swapnil. Thank you for, for, for having me. And the pleasure is all mine. Uh, this is the first time I've talked to you. So I would also love to know a bit about the company. Please give us a quick overview of the company, uh, what do you folks do, and how do you folks fit into the content delivery ecosystem? Laminar is this wholly owned subsidiary of a parent media corporation uh, where we basically provide a platform as a service to anybody who wants to launch their own version of a Netflix or, or an Amazon Amazon Prime or what have you. So we essentially allow media owners to spin up uh, a full service over the OTT platform uh, within a matter of weeks uh, with all of the bells and whistles and features that you can ask for with apps across all, all, all uh, the entire sort of fragmented device ecosystem. We sort of cover for all of that and uh, for multiple business models. Um, and so, you know, we uh, are heavily reliant on, on using CDNs and Akamai is, is our preferred partner in most cases. The reason behind today's discussion also that you folks recently, uh, you know, achieved 99%, you know, cash hit ratio. So I want to get into that, and but I want to build some foundation there. Uh, what is cash hit ratio and uh, what impact it has on uh, streaming performance and, of course, cost and other optimizations there? Well, I mean, it goes beyond cost now. I, I think the critical thing to think about this, right, is when we work with a media partner who's like, hey, I'm launching a service and um, I'd like to be available globally, they typically will not have a concentrated number of users in any one location and their users will be spread across a variety of spaces. Um, and the one thing that we do know is that to retain users, you have to have a video start in a few seconds. Like if it's going to take even four or five seconds, that's that's one or two seconds too many for a video to start. You want to hit play and the video should start playing. Um, one of the challenges with that is within sort of the, if you set it up in a traditional sort of edge networking fashion, you need a concentrated group of users where the content is getting cached at the edge and therefore it's available to users as they come on. Um, we've been trying to solve for this, especially for the services that we work with to make sure that it doesn't matter even if you have a sparser number of users and spread across different parts of the world. How do we solve for it so that every user has the best experience possible, especially when it's the first time that they're they're using uh, your your system or your, your service? So the cash hit ratio is essentially how do we make sure that as much content as possible is available at the edge so that you don't have to come back to us over the public internet, get the content and deliver it to a user. The, the content's essentially just sitting there at the edge waiting for the user to hit play. So I, that's what we solve for. Uh, and just to give, like, you will have better benchmarks than we, than we will, but a lot of people, like, if they hit, like, 90, 95% cash rate ratios, they're very happy, right? Uh, a lot of services work at, at much less than that. So for us to head towards 99.7 uh, is something that we're pleased about because it's just making the user experience a lot better for all our customers and, and their end users, right? Uh, so very, very happy to have sort of got to this point. If you can talk about, you know, how you managed to achieve that, what caching techniques and technologies and tools you used. And um, also, we can also talk about the impact on customer experience and also for CDN providers like Akamai. For end users, they're able to watch almost any video very quickly. It doesn't take them a long time to start watching it. And that's because the content is getting cached at the edge uh, in a more efficient fashion. I think what the best way to describe what we've done is that we've learned how to be power users of Akamai over the course of the last, uh, we've been doing this for now five years. And, and it's, been a, it's been a great journey for us where the folks on our team, uh, Shaurav and Luis and Gerard and a bunch of these guys, they've sort of been able to dive in and really understand how your systems work. 
and and the optimization start with a better understanding of your system so the so we can start doing things within the, the ecosystem we control whether it's how we transcode files what the segments are that we how we set up segments and so on so that we are able to leverage the stuff that you're already doing so the basic optimizations were just getting better in your short lived cache like how do we really use your short lived cache really well and i think uh, with cloud wrapper especially we're able to create pseudo origin servers which are sitting much closer to the edge so that for most content you do not have to do a hop over the public internet to our origin servers right you can sort of within akamai's network itself that content starts to become available so much closer to the edge than coming back to our server and going back all the way to your user uh, i know this sounds i'm presuming that your audience is more technical than not so i'm not sort of trying to dumb it down too much but i think that's the the simplest way to sort of describe this that between cloud wrapper between understanding you know how how your your systems work and getting beginning to understand as that as well as possible and and i think now the folks in our team understand it really well and are able to sort of really leverage the tools that you're providing whether it's you know how we do a regex pattern better so that it's more optimal whether it's how we set up our segments how we sort of make sure that our segments are matching up to what how your prefetching works so that we we can sort of use your the the stuff that you you've actually made it easy but we're sort of figuring out how to really use it like a power user and i think that's the best way to describe it and it's been a, it's been a great partnership uh, you you helped us learn a lot along the way I think from a, a purely from a from a, from our customers and where they when they're thinking about scaling into new geography, it changes the calculus and how much money they need to spend from a marketing and customer acquisition perspective because they don't need to spend a lot of money upfront necessarily. They can test out markets and so on, right? So they can even with a smaller sort of group of users that they might have acquired organically or with 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 low grade marketing efforts they're still able to expand into a geography and have those users have a have a have, have a really good experience when they're using their when they're using the service when i'm listening to you uh, it's it's a lot about performance but uh, cost is also becoming a big factor uh, and companies you know struggle with high egress uh, fee you know when it comes to hyperscaler uh is there any impact of you know by optimizing cache hit ratio does this also impact on the cost as well yeah because we just not there's no egress happening right like if it's if it's within the akamai network there's no egress from our network on a particular request or you know the content refresh is happening often enough that we're not having to come back to the original and then go back to akamai so we bring down egress so the the simple thing is that if egress was happening one out of 10 times which is a 90% hit ratio and it's happening now one out of 100 times which is a 99% or even less then that's uh, that's a 10x cost saving just on on egress for us right and then we're able to tra- pass on those costs to to our customers as well and if i'm not wrong you folks have also coined the term cache 2020 loop what is it and what does it mean for streaming services so, and as a as a journalist you will appreciate um, the the idea of coming up with headlines that are more pun than anything else and and I, and i will i will apologize and admit that we have a tendency to do that a little too much um, but i i think it starts with it's a cold start problem for a lot of our providers right and the I, and why i call it a cold start problem is when a streaming service launches or expands into a market for the first time it takes them time to get enough users in that market where the there is enough traffic happening so that the short lived cash that is typically sip, sitting at the akamai edge is um is not sort of flushing itself out and content isn't disappearing it needs to go back from our origin service right which directly impacts how long it takes for a video to start playing when someone hits play uh and this is especially important when you're you're expanding into a new market and you're like i want my users to have the same or better experience than they would on any other service that they're currently using in that market so the the it's a catch 22 if you will because you need a lot of users for caching to work well and you don't have enough users but you still want caching caching to work so that they get the experience that 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 caching actually provides and that is i think the the fundamental problem that that we we've been able to solve and and that's why again i apologize we decided to call it uh, the cache 22 problem 
I mean, of course, uh, AI is one of the hottest topics these days. Are you folks using AI in any capacity in the company? Uh, across the, across our tool chain? Oh, yeah. Across our tool chain. So, you know, it's it's a bunch of places, everything from whether we're using for dubbing and sort of um, ident identification of keyframes, how we think about transporting. So, um, I th the, our perspective on AI is to sort of think of it as a really good servant for specific tasks across our, our tool chain, which allows us to scale stuff. I think the best use of it is actually on the ad tech side that we're, I, I don't know how relevant this is for, for this conversation, but um, uh, at APMC, one of the things that we also run is something called AdCurate. It's used by, it's it's available on the AWS marketplace. It's used by Visio and LG and all these other guys. But fundamentally what we're able to do is um, within the programmatic sort of space, uh, you know that metadata tagging is very poor. Like half of the ads that come through are often incorrectly tagged. So we solve for that. We also do creative review as an automatic part, automated part of that process. So we have a fairly sort of extensive stack out there. We're doing a lot of like, so I wouldn't, I know everyone wants to get onto this hype train that I'm a little sort of careful about suggesting that we're an AI company. We're not, we're not building LLMs. We're not doing any of those things. We're, we're using AI and, and external LLMs or sort of like using a, an existing LLM and training an agent on, a, on that for a specific purpose. So we're doing all of those things, but I, would say I, I wouldn't go any further than, further than that. Thank you. Now, can you also talk about what are the things in your pipeline for 2025? From a product perspective, there's a lot that's going on. I think one of the, if you just look at structural shifts that are happening, right, the, the fundamental structural shift of uh, the distribution of media away from proprietary forms of distribution like cable or satellite or DDH is, is, is I think, accelerating and certainly has since since 2020, especially during COVID, you, you saw that shift start to accelerate and that has gone to a point now where I think it's interesting for us. So half of uh, households in the US don't have a cable connection at all any longer. Um, about 80% of households have a a smart TV or a connected TV with a bro broadband connection uh, in the U.S. right now. So we're sort of seeing that shift accelerate, and we're and we're seeing the impact of that shift as well in terms of how people are are expecting to consume content, not just which means that folks on the content side need to sort of replace their engineering stack or add on to their stack in some way, their distribution stack. I think we're well placed to serve those folks to come in and say, hey, you don't need to sort of reinvent everything, spend a lot of money, we can come in and, and help you get this off the ground very quickly. Uh, the second place, I think there's a there's a there's there's again a sort of structural shift happening is around how content gets monetized. And and the, depending on which part of the world you're in, you're starting starting to see the subscription model change uh, from being a monolithic subscription in many cases to being far more fragmented. There is a, there's a real space for ads to come in and for you either to have hybrid services or AVOD only or a combination of SVOD, TVOD, AVOD. Um, and we're, we're sort of well-placed to serve all of that, not just from a tech stack perspective, but also as a monetization partner. We're, we're a very large demand partner for a bunch of uh, supply side, um, very large supply side partners. So, you know, like we... Well, I, I think we're well placed to sort of play in that, but from a pure product roadmap perspective, I think we're sort of thinking through all of these pieces and, and thinking about the things that our customers want next. So we're bringing in a commerce on platform, we're bringing in uh, how you think about gaming and gambling and all of those pieces for depending, again, market de dependent. And I, I think one of the choices that we made early on in sort of not having a monolithic uh, realizing that regulations or, or the regulatory landscape that our customers have to deal with is not a monolithic landscape again it's actually a very fragmented landscape and being able to sort of address each part of the world differently in terms of their laws and regulations on on all aspects right how content gets labeled how you can transact what taxes apply to you whether you can set up a game a skill based game skill based game or not whether you can conduct commerce or not I think that's really helping us now to sort of really roll out a lot of these features, which I, which I, many of our customers have already started to use. So, so I'm excited to see how content monetization continues to shift and how we can sort of continue to serve our customers to, so that they can leverage that the best that they can. Naren, thank you so much for joining me today, and of course, uh, uh, shared a lot about the company, you know, the Cash Twenty Two or Cash Twenty Two, uh, you know, loop, uh, and also folks to understand all the back end when they enjoy all these streaming content. Thanks for sharing all those insights and I would love to have you folks back on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Swapnil. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us.